everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I have a very special guest. She's been on this podcast before, but today we're going to talk about specifically on her comedy special, Funny Women of a Certain Age on Showtime. She's the creator, the producer, and she also is on the comedy special. She's amazing. She's kick-ass. Total girl boss. So please welcome the amazing Carol Montgomery. That you are the creator and producer of Funny Women of a Certain Age, and we're going to focus on that today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe we can we can show a little clip of the first one and the second one because you have two. Right, right, right. We have funny women of a certain age and then more funny women of a certain age. I know. This is so cool. So let me see. I'm not sure which one this is, if it's the first one or the second one, but I am going to share screen and you guys can see how funny this special is right there. Okay. Wow, there we go. Look at that. Yeah. Cool. I'm not doing the birthdays anymore. When you consider a 50-year-old a younger man, what's to celebrate? <laughs> the difference between, like, young people sex and old people sex is that young people can go for hours, not old people. If you do 10 minutes, you could die. <laughs> Every guy in Brooklyn looks like a Viking on a bicycle. When did looking like a biblical figure become a hot look? <laughs> I love that. And then there's another one. Right. This is the second one. It's very nice to be on women of a certain age because what would the all male special be called? Congress? Um, <laughs> I'm transgender. I was married when I came out. I said, honey, we have to talk. She said, look at me. She goes, is it another woman? <laughs> Listen, my sweet young millennials, you have something that our generation will never have again. <laughs> Amazing. That is so funny. So let's talk about the talent. Um, yeah, let me, sure. Let me stop sharing there. And there we are. There we are. Yes. Now we are. We're back. Uh, so, yeah. So you had Fran Drescher emceeing the first one. Right. So have you known her for a while? How did you get Fran to um, host the show? Uh, we, um, my, my producing partner and I um, had reached out to her people. And um, we uh, and and she she was into it, really. And uh, you know, she she really, a friend Drescher, I is 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 one of the nicest, kindest human beings I've mm -hmm. I've ever met in my life. And she's you know, people forget she's a huge star. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like she's yeah. she's a huge star. And so when I first met her, I met her on set, and um, and and. And my, my partner brought brought her over in the first and of course this is before COVID. And so the first thing I said to her was, Can I hug you? And she was like and she she hugged me and because she you know, she really had a lot to do with it because by by attaching her to the special, you know, it became what it became. It you know, it was the highest showtime's highest rated comedy special of two thousand nineteen. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So so and she's you know, I, I always say, uh Whatever Fran wants, if she, you know, uh, if she needs me, I'm there. I did. Um, she has a an organization called Cancer Schmancer. Oh, and um, right after the last, uh, the uh, the the first special aired, she would they they do a a cruise around Manhattan to raise money for the organization. She asked me to be on it. And I said, whatever you need, whenever you need me. And then like a couple of months after that, she, uh, her assistant reached out and said, Fran's going to be doing the improv. She wanted to know if you'd open for her. And I was like, I was literally on the plane the next day. So she's, and I'm doing, we're doing Cancer Schmancer this year, all, but it's virtual. But she asked me to be on it this year. And people, and everyone was like, we know it's not live. And I'm like, whatever she wants. I mean, she really well, is. She's a, she's a mensch. You know, she's a good oh, girl. Nice. Nice. She seems to be a really sweet. Yeah, like, she's a good girl. Real. Yeah. Yeah. That's very. amazing. That's amazing that you got her. So that helped tremendously. Mm -hmm. How yeah, it helps to attach a star usually, I, I think, right? The yeah. Absolutely. The first time. The second time then, you know, you're already established. Well, but we but we did but we did a we our neck, you know, we attached Caroline Ray and she's a yeah. huge star. Oh my and god, yes. Yeah, so I mean, you know, Showtime likes having 
they love they love the idea of the show, but they do want, um, you know, they they want they they want they wanted to have they want to have some name on it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, how do you pick the comics that are going to be on the show? What what do you look at first? Well, what I always say, you know, there there's a live show and then there's the TV show. So the TV mm -hmm. show, you know, the T the TV show, it, it's a con it's um, what's the right word? Con conglomerate con conglomeration. It, it, it's really a group effort. You know, I have the people that I want on the show. Then my partner has people that he wants on the show. Then the network has people that they want on the show. So we basically we we get we bring our list together and then we we, we go well how do you, well yeah and it's also they have to flow with who else is on the show. Mm -hmm. So most of, you know for the for the TV shows especially these are people that have either been in the business for years and haven't had credit you know a big break or they've had major credits but you know life goes on and people they're coming around again to the next phase and so they they you know and there's not a lot of work for older women so they jumped on and for the live show i, I it's a little more open you know i prefer that I, I prefer that people have been in the business for a while i you know not that there aren't plenty of great women that have who are older that have started to stand up recently, but I need to know that if I leave, mm -hmm. like for some reason, if I have to go somewhere, I don't have to worry about the show. And with the live show and with the TV show, the TV show, especially, I mean, I didn't even have to be there. I could, mm -hmm. it ran, it ran amazingly. That's awesome. And what would you consider a seasoned comedian? Is there like a certain amount of years, a certain amount of credits? What would you in your estimation, what would be a seasoned comedian? A seasoned comedian has to have at least 20 years on them. Yeah. They have to. You know, I mean, the, I, I'm sure you've heard this, but co comics of my generation, I, I've been doing stand-up since 1979, so it's wow. 42 years. So wow. every every comic like myself will tell you, it, you don't really, you don't even get to, you don't even know yourself and who you are on stage until you're in it for 10 years. Period. That is the yeah. rule. And when you tell young comics that, they look at you like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Because you just don't, you just don't know yourself until then." Mm -hmm. There are a few comics that have made the break out under ten years, but that's really few and far between. You know, you, you don't even really know unless you're working constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, constantly every night, four or five, six sets a night. There's no way that you're going to be get, you're going to get stronger unless you have to put in the years. You have to the yeah. hours really. It's like more like the hours. Right, right, so right. Hours. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you tend to also because uh, we talked about this last time? Um, people that you know that you've worked a bit with before and you know that they're nice people, they're cool people, they're reliable. How important is that in a percentage? Like, you know, oh, what that's, is seven and what is that percentage? That's, like? that's number one. I mean, I'm, I'm, one, I'm, yeah. I'm 63. There is, I don't want drama in my life anymore. Period. Period. I just don't. I, you know, everyone that does the show knows that you come in, you do your spot and you mm -hmm. leave. And this is in TV and this is in the live show. I don't have time for bullshit. I don't have time for people going over the light. And you know what? And, and this, but you know what? Women don't do that. You know, no. it's, ve it's very rare that a female comic will blow the light or, yeah. you know, so, I mean, look, we, we love talking about the fact that, especially for the first special, the second special, we, we forgot to put the monitor in the back, but the first special, there was a monitor in the back. So everyone was sitting around the monitor watching the other comics perform. Mm -hmm. And for the second special, you know, some of the girls were nervous, so we were surrounding them. You know, all the other girls were like, you're going to kill it. You're going to do great. Uh -oh. you, you know, this is the way women do it. You know what I mean? So I, yes. I, I and I said that. To, and if you, I, I, I get very cocky about this because both specials, the show started and was at this level and it never left that. I mean, it never went below that level. It nice. went like, it, it went like this. I mean, everybody knocked it out of the park and you right. have to be able to do that. You know, 
comedy, you know, we, we're, we're living in a time, especially during COVID, because mm-hmm. now everybody's like, well, I have Zoom, so I, I must be a comic. Oh no. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. so you have to know that whomever is on the show, that, like with the TV specials especially, that you're going to have to follow them and not bitch about it and just go, oh, shit, she just killed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to kill now. Right. And, 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 and you, you, you only get that way if you're a seasoned comic. Like, I love telling the story. I know that right now he's considered, um, you know, taboo right now. But I used to work with Joe Rogan when I was at the comedy store. This is before he had his podcast and before the, t- the sitcoms. He was just another guy doing stand-up. Yeah. And I, I, his, he used to end with a bit about tigers fucking which was the, one of the funniest bits I'd ever seen, but it was strong and it was powerful. And then I would have to follow him. This was every night in the main room at the comedy store. And, you know, you, if, if you learn to have to follow that, you mm-hmm. learn that, okay, now I'm on stage, I'm taking command of the stage. But, so when comics tell me, oh, I'm ready to headline, or I'm ready to do the, it's like, okay, no, you're not. You're not, you, it takes a long time to feel comfortable to, f- to follow and know that you're going to do as well as the other person. Absolutely. Yeah. That takes a lot of time. And um, so what, what do you think is the most important thing uh, for a comic, like whoever's starting out, uh, what would you advise them to do, you know, what they need to do to become at that headliner level? What are the three most important things? Well, stage time, stage yeah. time, stage time, stage time. You know, I used to teach. I, I probably, I may be going back to teaching now that New York is starting to open up. I may be teaching back at uh, QED, which is where I started. Right. Um, and um, I always tell people, you have to get on stage. Like, I, look, Zoom was all we had. So, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, it, and it saved all of us. But yeah. like... When the pandemic, you know, when the pandemic hit, I was devastated because I, I didn't know. I mean, like, I didn't know what was going to happen to this business. So the what happened for me is that I said, okay, now I have to get up and I have. So we did outdoor shows and 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 did whatever we had to do to get on stage, stage time, getting on stage in front of a live audience is the number one thing, and 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 getting good at it. You know, it's. It, it, there's a young comic that I work with a lot and she, you know, I brought her, she's, she's open for me a couple of times. And the difference, because she's, she's one of those people that just hustles. She's constant. She's always like working and she's doing, which is what you're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. And she is strong now. She's moved into being strong. She's still got years to go because mm-hmm. this, this isn't, like I said, I've always said, this isn't, um, this isn't a, a you know ten yard dash. This is a marathon. Yes. So the most I think the number one thing more than anything is you have to get on stage, and you have to and you know like I'm working on a new ten right now, and you know I'm doing Zoom shows. I'm getting on. I'm doing bar shows because I have to hear whether or not what I I know the jokes are good, but I still have to you know I'm I'm piecing it together and all that stuff. So it's, like I said, stage time, stage time, stage time. Yeah, I agree. And and write also a lot. Right. Yes. Uh, you, but but you see, the thing about one of the things I used to have a student come in every week with new material. And I went, You're, you, you don't have to do that yet. Right. Because if you have the way I started, I, I started, I, I started with five minutes. And but then I worked that five minutes till I knew it like in the back of my head. And then mm-hmm. I did the next five minutes. And then, and then I pieced together. For example, for, for the la- okay, for the first special, I wanted to do this whole. It's been so long since I've done forty-five minutes, but my act, you know, there, there's certain, you know, I have a, a a certain flow to my act, right? Sure. So I was taking pieces. I went, okay, I want to do this piece. I'm going to do this piece. I'm going to do this piece for the for the ten minutes, and I was like. And it was working, but it was clunky because it was, you know, I wanted to talk about my son in the first, in the first special. So I was literally the weekend before we were, we were supposed to be taping, I was working a, a gig in the Poconos and, it, you know, it's a, and I was, I was doing my full 45 and I came across, I did the bit, the pieces that end up in the first special. 
And I was like, why don't you just do this? You know this, you know this piece, is this one chunk. I've been doing it for so many years. Why don't you do that piece? So that's what I did, and it ended up being great. And then for the second special, I had worked on, oh, for, it was a year later that we did the second special. I was able to work all the material I wanted to do about my son, and I put it in the second special. So it's a matter of you have to know the material is good. You can't, you know, like, I, I, you can't. Yeah. You, you, yes, writing is very important, but you have to you have to make sure the material. You know, you, nobody gets more than five or six minutes these days to work on stuff. Yep. So so make sure that it's the the six or seven minutes that is the tightest that you can make mm -hmm. it. Then throw that. Then put that material aside. Then go to the next five. Exactly. And hone. That's the thing because it's not like you try it once; it's gonna work. It's like right. if something is working, okay, then, you know, you hone it and you try to tag it or whatever, you know, right, but you, right. I do that. I focus on a couple of bits that I just keep, you know, working on it and right. throwing them out there and, and tweaking them. And, and that's how they get good right? for a while. So it takes, it takes a minute to get the bits to be good. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, like the, the stuff, I, what I, like I said, because we had the outdoor shows, I was able to do a lot, you know, I was able to write some new stuff and, and, and hone it during the outdoor shows. And now, you know, a lot of the material is going to be dated now because it's COVID, it's COVID related, but you know, right. I, I do want to keep a couple of things in it. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, so now I've been saying to people, you know, I just, I need to get up. I need to get up. I need to get up. Yeah. And even somebody like myself, and it's important that people who are watching, I mean, I've been doing stand up for 42 years and I've made a living and I've raised a family. Wow. So I know what I'm talking about when I, if I, I'm the laziest, I mean, I am literally doing this podcast, sitting on a couch. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I am, my legs are out. I am comfortable. Nothing, but nothing I am the late, but, but what, but, but if, if, when I know I have to work on something and this is, I, I this is my next 10, I know I have to work on this. So mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm literally reaching out to people who don't even know me. And I'm like, can I get on your bar show? And they're like, well, who the hell are you? I'm like, I'm just another comic who wants to work. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't pull rank. I just say, mm -hmm. I, I need to work. You don't have to pay me. Yeah. You know, I just need to get up and so, and so, you know, and hopefully, uh, hopefully in a month it'll, it'll be where I want it. That's amazing. Yeah. And do you find that as you know, with as the years go by and you're more seasoned, then does it take less time to hone a bit or the same Time. What do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. And th that's a great question, actually, because I, I'm going to use an example um, with Dane Cook. OK, let's use Dane because I'm not a fan of his, but he was he 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 was a superstar, it, yeah. you know, was. OK. The problem with when you when you hit that big. All that material that you worked on for years. Is gone. Yeah. Do you understand? Like it's yes. gone. So it. yeah, it, it's done. So, yeah. so you, the, anyone that does, anyone who's been in the business over 20, 25 years and hasn't done a TV special, when they do a TV special, it will be a good TV special. And then they have to start again. And yeah. So, so, so that first, like for me, the first special you know, was all my, you know, my sex stuff and my dirty stuff. And I have been doing that material for 20 years, Yeah. you know, and the second special, which was the kid stuff, which I'd been doing on and off because, you know, my son's now 29. So I did material about, you know, from the beginning all the way to, you know, now. Sure. Some of it was new. Some of it was old. But that first special with all the, all the, all the dick jokes, because I love my dick jokes. Um, <laughs> we all do. Come on. Right. But, but, that, but then it, but you know, yeah. that's, you'll never get, you'll never get the jokes as good as when you've been doing them for 20 years. Yeah. And then you have exactly. to, well, I don't get rid of anything. I'm like the biggest recycler. I'm like, fuck <laughs> it. I'm doing material that I did. Like I was looking at old material that I wrote because we were going through some boxes and stuff. And I was like, wow, I, this is great stuff. Why am I not doing this anymore? So, you know, it's, I, I, like I said, I think the first chunk, the first 45 headlining material that, that you have 
it takes years. And then the then you have to work harder at yeah. making the material. Like the I opened I opened the second show um with a joke I had literally written six months before and I'd never done that before. Mm. The joke is basically that um uh uh uh, I talk about there's um, uh, when you get older, there's uh, there's a lot of moaning, but it's not from sex. And then I, I, I talk about my sister and her husband being in the living room while I was doing the dishes and I'm hearing all these moaning things. <laughs> and I'm like, are they fucking in the living room? And then I walk in and I'm like, oh, they're trying to get off the couch. <laughs> but I wrote that literally the summer like we taped in October. I wrote it that summer because that happened. My sister yeah. and her husband did that. And I went, that's going in the act. And I'd never done that before. I'd never written it. That was the newest joke I'd ever done. And then I did it for TV. So it really, ma it really, you know, maybe it's the confidence of knowing that the joke is it, it's because it's such a good joke. It's yeah, going to work. Is. But you don't really know. And, you know, and that has to do with yeah. live audience. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So how can you tell us a little bit like the journey of uh, from maybe showcasing? I'm sure you showcased the show mm. to getting the deal. What was the, the whole trajectory and why did you pick Showtime versus another network? Well, uh, a couple of things. So. You know, we're all in this business a long time and we all have ideas. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, this, you know, we all like, I, you know, you've heard, you've heard the old saying, you know, you throw enough shit on the wall, something's going to stick, right? Yeah. So when I came up with the idea, I was on the, I was coming home from a podcast with a bunch of women and I said to my husband, why isn't there any show with women, you know, who are older? You know, I've always I've always railed about this. Even when I was in my 30s and 40s, I was like, the older people are the ones that have the money. I mean, like, it's you know, right. right. Yeah. So yeah. so my husband goes, this sounds this is like a really good idea. And it it's it snowball it, from the moment I had it. We all knew we, this was something different because it it just kept snowballing. And my partner who I produced um, Shang Forbes, you know, Shang. Right. Oh my God! I totally okay. know that. Of course. Yeah. Yes. So I produced his special, and my and my partner, I I produced with him. I you know I used to always, I always bring him whatever project I'm working on. Like, do you want to work on this? And when I told him about this, he goes, "This should be a TV show." I went, "All right, go sell it." And so we basically put together a list of everyone we knew. He had his network people. I had my network people, mm -hmm. and we basically went in and we pitched it. Nice. And I met with Showtime. I think it was, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I, I, I want to say it was in November. It was in November. I'm not really, I don't really remember, but, um, and, and they got it right away. They got it right away. And the reason I wanted to go to Showtime first, and, and I've told the network people this, is when I, uh, my first major credit was a, th uh, a show called the Showtime Comedy Club All Stars. Okay. Now, back in the day, what they did was they had the, uh, HBO had their show, The Young Comedians, and Showtime had what they call the Comedy Club Network, and they took crews all over the country, every city. They would have, you know, from Zanies, from, from, you know, so show. I did, the, I did my uh, my sh uh, comedy club show at uh, somewhere in Boston. They were, they had it at the Punchline in San Francisco, and from that, they picked the All Stars. Mm -hmm. And and I was one of the all stars. I was uh, it was Showtime All Star Six. Don Rickles was my host. Um, it, you know they gave me my first break. They literally gave me my first break. So I wanted to go to Showtime first, and they they jumped on it. They loved the idea, right. but you know to try to sell something, you know people nobody everyone's afraid to do anything until they have a better idea of what it is. So then we decided in February, we, this is two or three years ago, we said, you know, maybe we should do a showcase f for industry. So what we did was I have a, we have a residency here in New York City at the Crane Theater. We're going, I think our fourth year or our fifth year. I don't really remember because COVID. Nice. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. And I said to them, I said, we want to bring in, you know, we want to bring in ind industry to it. We did a show. It was uh, Vanessa Hollingshead, uh, Veronica Mosey, and Leanne Lord. 
And I didn't tell them that there was industry because I've done enough industry soap cases. When you do that, everyone gets nervous and don't, nobody does their job. They all knocked it out of the park. Nice. All the network were like, this is amazing. This is great. And I said to Dave, you go talk to everybody. But he knew. He knew in the end I still wanted to end up with Showtime. They were all interested in it. But I was like, nope. Showtime gave me my first break. We're going back to Showtime. And they've been amazing. They've been absolutely wonderful. That's great. And what were some of the comments that other networks made about the show besides loving it? Did they have any suggestions no. or nothing? They just no, loved nobody, it? No, nobody. I mean, one, one, and, and I don't, I, I, everyone says, well, what, which network was it? And I said, I don't remember. Okay. Because, <laughs> but, but, but one network actually said, this is a great idea. Can we do it with younger women? No, that's yeah. the whole point. I know. And it was just like, oh, we're not going with you. But yeah. I don't remember who it was. I mean, we had, I, I remember seeing the guest list and it was Amazon, HBO, CNN was there because they were thinking about possibly doing it as a documentary. Oh, uh, wow. Hulu was there. Uh, TLC was there. I think Lifetime was there. I mean, everyone was there to see this show. But like I said, I, 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 I knew even though we did the showcase mm -hmm. and Showtime, of course, was there. I knew that I wanted to go with them. Yeah. You yeah, know? Because you're loyal. You seem to be a very loyal person. I'm very loyal. Very Everyone loyal. knows that about me. I'm, I'm, I, I'm ridiculously loyal. You know, if, if it was up to me, you know, I, first of all, we, we, I, you know, I've always wanted to do this as an actual series. You know, mm -hmm. if it was up to me, we'd, we'd be doing this show every week, and it would be people who have done the live show constantly. But what happens is, is, you know, there are there are definitely friends of mine that, are, you know, are like, I know friends of mine come to me and go, you know, I really want to do the show. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not only up to me. I mean, right. like I told you at the beginning, it was my 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 partner, the network. And you can't when you're dealing with networks, you can't you can't. Not that you can't demand it. You, Of course, you can tell them whatever you want, but you have to be careful for what you know because you, you if you if you turn around and say well i if you don't give me this i'm not doing that and then they go okay well now the show's not happening so you have to learn how to like i, I tell this great story and it's similar it's not about show business she's not in show business but i have a, a, an old friend of mine who was this great artist and she had this one beautiful um painting that was hanging in her in her gallery and somebody came to me because I was in her gallery when she was doing it and said, we want to buy that. We'll give her $10,000. And the woman said no, because she didn't, that was her baby. So it's like, well, then why do you have it up for sale? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to learn that it, 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 it's, it's give and take in, it, when you're, when you're selling something, you know, you learn you learn to go, okay, well, okay. I understand that you want this. So, but I want this. And that's, that's part of negotiating. Absolutely. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, where did you shoot the specials? We shot both of them at the Bell House in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I didn't want to do it. Um, I wanted it to be more theater-like. And mm -hmm. I didn't really want, you know, we we were, you know, we could have done it in like at Gotham, but Gotham looks too comedy clubbish. Like there are some yeah. comedy clubs all over the country. Like Levity Live doesn't look like a comedy club. It looks like a theater. That's in Westchester. So there, there are rooms that don't look like comedy clubs. But the Bell House was in Brooklyn. I also wanted to shoot in Brooklyn because I grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah. So I wanted it to be part of my, you know, that I returned back to Brooklyn. So, yeah. So we, we shot both of them at the Bell House. Nice. Oh, yeah. It has that feeling of um, theater. Where right. It's, it, it, yeah. I love that vibe. Yeah. And, I, and what was funny is... <laughs> You know, it's it's such a it's it's so weird still for me, because you know I you know first of all I was also the executive producer of it, so right. in the daytime, you know, you get there at noon, you know, and everyone's yeah. like, well how, well, how does this look for you? And I'm like, looks fine. Well, well, you have to make the decision if it looks good or not. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh right, oh yeah, it looks really good. Like the lighting, the first special, it's very different. It's very subtle. I think it was pink and yellow with it dominant being pink and i think for the second special it was yellow it was the dominant with pink but it looks similar but it's different it's slightly different right so you know? how 
did you deal with, because I've, I've done that before, Willie, you like executive produce, I did for PBS, executive produced, and I was also the host. So you have to switch brains, you know, like the right side and the left side. Oh, yeah. So how how did you handle all that? Because that's a lot to handle, to switch from one to the other, like on the spot. Um, <laughs> actually, so it's funny you mentioned that, because for the first special, I was literally running around, you know, because we also shot interstitials where we interview the people and all that stuff. Oh, wow. So um, literally, I think the show started at 7.30. We were starting to shoot at 7.30. Literally at 7 o'clock, the gentleman who's my, who's my Showtime exec says, you need to go backstage, Carol. Stop, stop producing. I was like, yeah, but I have this one thing I have to do. We go, and he literally pushed me backstage. Yeah. He literally said, go. Oh, wow. Somebody else will take care of it for you. And I was like, okay. And then it, it was hard. And, and, my, and yeah. um, Vanessa Hollingshead, who's, who I'm cat sitting for her right now, um, she, she, both specials, she was there. She did the show, the first special and the second special. She was there. But she was like, okay, let's go over the set. While I was getting makeup, she goes, let's do the set. Keep running it. Keep running it. Just say 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 it. And for the second special, it, there was a little more. There wasn't. There was. A, 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 I, I was doing a lot. I, I, didn't, I, 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 I didn't take that moment to come down to, do, to start to be a performer. And she and Vanessa is the one that pulled me aside and said, you need to go do something where you're not, you know, where you're not. Other, and she made me go over my set. Otherwise, I never would have gotten through that. I literally would not have gotten through it because. I totally understand. It's a whole different space. Right. That you have and, to be in. Right. Because people are still, even though they were backstage, people were still like, do you need this or should we do this? And I was like, right. I need to concentrate. I'm going on stage in like 10 minutes. Yeah. So can I just have a moment and. So yeah, so it, it, it's it's not easy to do, and to be honest, and I've said this before, I love stand up, but my goal and my goal for doing this is that I can just be producing women's comedy specials. Like I want to be, you mm -hmm. know, it's great that I do the stand up, and I know that everyone loves seeing me on the specials. But the the goal for this has always been to give women a voice under the woman of a certain age uh, umbrella and then go out and branch out and give them their own specials. And I'll EP that because then I don't have to worry about remembering my act. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I you know, I can barely remember my husband's name, okay? <laughs> and and people are saying, well, well, what do you think? And I'm like, okay, can I just have a moment? I need some coffee, you know? I mean, so, that yeah, it's, so funny. it's very hard. What it feels like to me is that you love helping other people. Uh, and so it seems like that would be the natural route for you to go ahead and produce individual comedy specials and help other women that way. I mean, that just seems natural. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because um, what when I've when I've produced for, for other people, like when I did Chang special. I was the one, I wasn't an EP on that, I was supervising producer, but as a comic, I know what a comic needs. Right, there okay? you go. Okay, mm -hmm. so like another friend of mine, we were, this is years and years ago, we were in discussions about me producing his special and then they ended up going with somebody else and he called me and said, I should have had you. And I said, why? He said, because this, the person who ended up producing wasn't a comic and he, he had no place to he had no place to relax before he went on like that's the most important mm -hmm. thing you so yeah. you know like just little things like that as a, as as a as a comic myself i know how to protect a comic and go yeah. okay like with shang the funny one of the funniest stories is is that we shot two of them we shot two back to back and so between the specials, he's in his dressing room he's got his friends there like which i understand you have that but like it I think it was a half hour. I hear the stage manager say, we have to clear out. And the stage manager was like this big. He was tiny. He was this little guy. And he walks out and he sees me. And I said, what's going on? He goes, nobody's leaving Chang's dressing room. <sighs> so I walked in and I went, everybody get the 
fuck out. <laughs> and everyone looked at me like, but you know what? They all left. And, and Shang looked at me and said, why did you do that? I said, because you have a half hour to chill out because you're taping a TV special, you moron. <laughs> you need time to relax. You yes. need to get focused. Yes, it's great to have friends there. Like even like for the first special, it, you know, it's so interesting because, I, you know, my son and I, everyone knows about me and my son. I'm very close, very yeah. close with my kid. Yeah. So and uh, I, uh, all I said to him was I knew he wasn't going to come early to the to the taping because he never comes early anywhere. My husband was there early. You know, he was he was there just to calm me down and everything. So I would say probably at seven, half hour, when I'm inside getting makeup, I, I said to the stage manager, I said, when my son shows up, you need to bring him backstage, please, because I need to see my kid. And they did. And they brought, you know, and, it, and it, 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 all I did, like, people all laughed at me. He walked in with his girlfriend, and I got up. I was literally, you know, in the makeup chair. I said, excuse me. And I went over, and all I did was lean against him. I just laid my head on his chest. And he, you know, he, just, he just, you know, he just rubbed my back. And I went. Like, like, it was not even if it was a minute, I'd be shocked. And then I went, all right, get out. I have to get ready. But I just, you know what I mean? I just need, he, yeah. he, he, he sent that ground yeah. to grounded. Yeah. He centers yeah. me more than yeah. anybody else. And my husband too. But, yeah. but there, but the first one was especially poignant because he, you know, you, you got to understand, I, I was doing stand up before I had him. He, I was pregnant and going on the road with him. Um, you Amazing. know, you know, like I, so, he, and you know, when I lived in Vegas and was raising him there, I was working as a comedian. Mm -hmm. So he's seen mommy go through Hills. He's seen her, He's seen mommy be a Las Vegas star. He's seen mommy lose all of her road work. He's seen. So for me, I had to, you know, it, I had to have him there. So, so like I said, so he's, a, you know, I, I do have a calming voice that way. I'm like, you just pat me on the back. You're going to be fine. All right. Goodbye. I love it. I love it. Do you have any funny stories on the road with your son as a baby? Um, uh, not really. You know, I mean, like I, I, I just most of the time I brought with I brought him when, when he was really young. Like I didn't bring him yeah. when he was old. Um, but 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 it's so, so think of the things I did, though. <laughs> I, um, you know, I one time I, I the first club I ever did was uh, the Funny Bone in Pittsburgh. I brought him with me and he was six weeks old and. Wow. Yeah, and nobody could watch him. There was no no there was nobody to I didn't I couldn't afford to hire a nanny. Yeah. So the bouncer says, I'll watch him. The bouncer was three hundred pounds, fully tatted, fully pierced, and a biker. Yeah. And Those I was like best, Yeah, and I was like, oh geez. So, but there was nothing I could do, right? Yeah. So after my set he was, they were upstairs. The office was upstairs. And, uh, so, you know, after my set, I'm like going, he's probably sold white slavery now, you know, I mean, child slavery, you know, like he's gone. And, uh, I run up the stairs and the bouncer is, he's, he's got him in his car seat and he's rocking the car seat. And I'm like, what's going on? He goes, well, he was crying. I don't want to take him out of the car seat. So oh. yeah, he looked like King Kong with like a plane. And he forgot. <laughs> so that, yeah. So that, but I didn't do, I, you know, but like, I, I didn't take him a lot when he was really, you know, when he was older because my husband was taking care of him. But as a baby, he went with me everywhere. Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing that you did that. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, like I, I was one of those, I, I grew up in the I am woman, hear me roar generation. So, you know, I, I, I you know, the, the other, the only other joke, funny thing that happened was, and it was the same thing because he was in his car seat. So he had to be about six or eight weeks old. And I'm doing some shitty one nighter in the middle in like Washington state. And I pull up and I bring the baby and the guy stops me at the front de at the door at the bar. And he goes, you can't bring the baby in. He's a minor. <laughs> it's a baby. And I said, what do you think he's going to do? Crawl up and ask for a fucking tit on the rocks. I mean, what's wrong with you? I said, all right, well, I'm the comedian and I have the baby. So either I go in with him or I leave. And of course they let me in, but it was such a moronic thing. It's a minor. <laughs> he's a minor. Okay. Cause you know, the cops are going to know yeah. that he's going to be fucking it's, people. Are, people are the dumbest ever. Yeah. 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 Totally dumb. So here, Howard, thank you, Howard, for the questions. 
Uh, he's asking, did Carol enjoy her time in Vegas and did that help her expand her brand name with new fans? And who did she tour with when she went overseas to entertain the U.S. troops? Wow. Wow. But very good questions, Howard. Thank you very much. I loved my time in Vegas. I, um, I have my, you know, I mean, if you ask my son, he says he grew up in Vegas, you know, because he was there when he got there when he was four. Um, some of my closest and dearest friends are still in there. Uh, you know, he's making a great living. Um, I, uh, you know, I would go back in a second. I would absolutely go back as a, but I wouldn't go work in a show. I wouldn't work in a burlesque show again. I'd work as, you know, in the Carol Montgomery Theater, for lack of a better, or the Funny wow. Women of a Certain Age Theater. Um, uh, uh, it did help my brand name, but what's interesting is, you know, I was probably seen. We tried to figure it out because I was in Crazy Girls at the, which it was at the Riviera at the time. We did. Eight, 13 shows a week and I was there for five years and then I was in Midnight Fantasy and I think we did I want to say we did 10 shows a week but my husband's a man he like likes to work with numbers so it, it there I was seen by millions of people wow. but it doesn't really you know there was no social media back then and there was not right. you know what I mean so so yes I'm sure people go oh I remember her she was in that show but it didn't help the way it would have helped if I was in it now. And going overseas, I worked with tons of comedians. I mean, uh, Leon Lord, Felicia Michaels, uh, Mark Riccadonna, Jim Andrinos. Those, that was my core. Um, um, Katie Chappelle, Katsy Chappelle. I'm trying to think of who else. Um, but, you know, I, I use the same people, be, same type of thing. No drama. Because especially when you go overseas, that's another thing. Young comics owners say, when you're going overseas... You have to, I mean, you have to work as one because mm -hmm. there's so much, you know, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're flying in Black Hawk helicopters, you're sleeping in barracks, you, you there, there's no time for bullshit. There is no, you know, there, there's no drama, no time mm -hmm. for bullshit at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dave is here asking, who are your favorite favorite comedians of all time? Besides Grace, I know. She loves me. That's why and I that's love very, you. That's very nice. So listen, Dave, send me some money <laughs> and I will uh, I will tell you who. No, I'm kidding. Um, my favorite comedian of, uh, of all time is Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another, you know, uh, great story, of course, not no internet at the time is I was, uh, when I was living in LA, I was working at the comedy store one night and um, uh, Mr. Pryor's bodyguard, who was like eight feet tall and, you know, a giant, you know, taps me on the shoulder after my set and goes, excuse me, ma'am, uh, Mr. Pryor would like to see you. And I was like, what? Who are you? What? So it's, uh, unbeknownst to me, he was sitting next, he was sitting with Mitzi watching the show and he was, you know, this is towards the end when he was very sick. And yeah. he, he, he said, come here. And I, I said, yes. And he said, I love you. I think you're really funny. And I looked at him and I, I almost, I almost, I mean, like I literally looked at Mitzi and went, I'm done. Thank you. I mean, like I, I didn't know what, I was so flabbergasted. And then wow. I called, I called my husband on a payphone, hysterical crying that Richard Pryor had said that he thought I was funny because, you know, and, and then of course, remember there was no camera phones. There was no phones. This was just one-on-one -on -one, me and Richard Pryor. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life. And then oh, my awesome. other great, my, my other favorite of course is um, George Carlin. And for females um, is Lily Tomlin. Yes. You know, I love her. I love oh, her God. so much. Brilliant. Absolutely. Here's Nate saying, I'm loving this interview. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Nate. I, I, I'm, I, that's very nice of you. I, I have nice listeners. Really, really cool. That's nice. <laughs> they're that's, I like they're that. all in here. They're so loyal. They're well, you know what? Before we wrap up, if anybody has any other questions, uh, you, know, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm laying here on the couch. There's finally a nice fucking breeze. <laughs> it's been 8,000 degrees here in New York City, and oh, there's finally God. a breeze. So I'm like kind of sitting here like I may fall asleep right after the show. So if anyone else has any, 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 any questions. Um, yeah, any questions before she falls asleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is there going to be a funny women of a certain age three? Um, we're hoping, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the pandemic uh, kind of threw a wrench 
Yeah. <laughs> kind of threw a wrench in everybody's life. Um, you know, because what's, what's, what I, what I tell people was so, it was so ironic. It was, so we, we shot the Today Show. It aired the Friday before, the, I think it was March 13th or 14th. And then the special aired, I think, on the 15th. And then that Monday we went into lockdown. So it's like, okay. So, you know, like, I think, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I would love for it to, like I said, I, I would love for it to be a series because there's so many, so many women yeah. that can be part of this, uh, you know, um, and, but the live show is, is still happening. You know, we, we still do the shows at the crane. Um, we have some, we have a couple of, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we had all these dates before the yeah, pandemic right. and then they all went away. And so now slowly, but surely some of those people are reaching out going, Hey, you know, we're, at this, we'd like to have you back. And then we're supposed to start a major tour in April of 2022. So that will be, a you know, we, we signed with a, a very big uh, production company slash agency, agency f just for the live show. So yeah. my other dream, besides, you know, producing specials under the uh, Funny Women of Certain Age brand is to rotate everybody, you know, um, and so, you know, it would be great to have a tour go to Chicago and then a tour go to Minneapolis. And But everyone had be different people. Right. Because there's so many women. There's a lot. Yes. You know, and it, it doesn't have to be women from the special, even though there are women from the special that have done my live show. There's so many women in this business that deserve to be heard and seen. So, you know, hopefully, you know, who knows? Let's see what the future brings, right? You know? It's it's all an adventure. And then you're doing a great, amazing. I <laughs> and also just and, and just one other thing I'd love to I'd love to mention yes. that, that I've I'm also branching out and doing other projects. Oh, um, and my next big project that that I'm really excited about is a solo show called Whore's Eye View. And it stars a young female comic named Caitlin Bailey. And it's a, I always fuck this up. It's a 10,000 year romp through the history of sex workers. And Ooh, nice. yeah, yeah. And it's, she's brilliant and she's funny. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're in rehearsals right now. We're doing a, a stage readings in June. And I see that, you know, that's like, that's my next thing that I'm like really, really excited about. But it, it, it is interesting because I do work mostly with women. Not that I don't love you guys. I do guys. I love men. You know, I, you know, years and years and years ago, um, somebody said some shitty thing to me like, well, you hate men. And I'm like, I don't hate men. I have a husband and a son. And if exactly. I hated men, I'd be eating pussy, wouldn't I? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, just, you know, you know, I, I've had people, I've had men come up to me and go, why don't you men of a certain age? I said, because uh, men of a certain age don't need me because Gaffigan doesn't need me. That's Louis right. C.K. doesn't need me. Women need to be seen, yep. you know, and, and, and women you know, there's so many of us. There's so many of us, and absolutely. You, you know, so so I'm I'm trying to do my part. Absolutely. Listen, I created Love at First Laugh is actually the funny female point of view on relationships. Right. I created it like eight years ago, and I produce show be shows because and help my female comedian peers uh, because there we don't have you know we get rejected a lot by the way. Right. Like right. I had a, a, a booker, a male booker say, oh, we don't book that many females because they are not a draw. Right. Like Really? Like In this yeah. day and age, they still say that? This was uh, like maybe four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, no. Before the Me Too, so <laughs> I'll give well, him that. It, well, I have to say, and I, maybe I'm being a little, uh, you know, full of myself, but I happen to think that because of my show, if you've noticed on, on network television, Mm -hmm. Katie Segal has a, a show. Queen Latifah has a show. Yep. Jean Smart has the show on HBO Max. All of a sudden, older women are all mm -hmm. of a sudden back in the... You're welcome, America. You're welcome. <laughs> it's all Carol Montgomery. That's right. You're welcome. It's so funny with the, the, the show Hacks. So many people have called me and said, it's your life. I said, okay, it's not my life because I wasn't a headlining comedian. I was part of a burlesque show. But everyone's like, yeah, but she has a kid. And I was like, you know, women can have kids 
and work in Las Vegas and not have the same life. You know, it's it's fascinating. But I I I I haven't watched it yet. But you know, I've heard it's some people love it. Some people think it's very you know you know. So we'll see. But 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 it is funny. I, I'm very proud of the fact that all of a sudden there are there are older women starring in TV series again. I love it. That's yeah. yeah that's the way it should be. It should be. Absolutely. So Nate is here asking you, what have been some of your biggest challenges as a comedian? Uh, have you ever had any crazy shows? Mm. That's a well, loaded question. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think what you're asking is like with hecklers, I'm assuming, you know, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't suffer hecklers well. So yeah. in other words, when people like, you know, my husband plays softball with, he's been doing this for, you know, forever. And he plays in Central Park. And there's always some asshole that's like, oh, you're a comedian. You know, I'm going to come see you and I'm going to heckle you. I'm going, please do. <laughs> what an idiot. Please do. Yeah. Please sit, sit in the front row, too. Yeah. Bring a girl. Yeah. Because when I, when I emasculate you. Yes. You know, um. So I don't suffer them well. Like I, mm. this is back in, you know, this is back in the day when, when the comedy clubs actually gave a shit about comics, but there'd be certain clubs I'd go to and the, and the bouncer would say, if you have a code word, like if somebody's, you know, you know, just say the code word and we'll, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll take the people out. I said, yeah, you know, you know what my code word is? I said, get them the fuck out. That's my code word. <laughs> I, I mean, I, around, no, 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 I don't. I mean, I, I'll banter for a minute, but if, if, and no. I, you know, believe me, I've had, you know, I, I will stop a show. Mm -hmm. I will stop a show and say, okay, here's the deal. The people around you have paid to see me. So I'm going to ask them what they want me to do. And the audience Ooh. is always like, get them out, get them out. You know, because it's like, I don't have time for this. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to play with you just because you didn't get breastfed when you were a fucking baby. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so most, uh, you know, the, the one time that, and it was, it was actually not scary because I, uh, you know, but people think it's scary. So I was playing in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho many years ago. And, um, I was on stage and I was, I was saying, somebody said that they, you know, this is the, the city where the John Birch Society was. And so, of course, I went off on a rant because I'm Jewish. And yeah. um, after the show, the bodyguards had to walk me to my room because they were worried that somebody was going to do something. And I was like, you know, I'm from New York. If I get mugged in fucking Coeur d'Alene, I can never go back to New York City, right? You know that. But, but yeah, that was the craziest. But like, you know, and what, what was the other question? I'm sorry, there was another question. Um, was... And the crazy shows, and what's your biggest challenge, I guess, as a comedian? Um, now, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any challenges left because I think I've broken the barriers on, um, you know, I, I would have said being older was going to be a challenge. But but I saw the, you know, that another thing, like I said, I'm 63. I saw the writings on the wall when I turned 50 hmm. that, it, that, that things were different. So that was 13 years ago. I, I moved back from, I we'd moved from Vegas to New York and the road had dried up. I was a road dog for years. I mean, I was on the road three weeks every month. And, and for the people who are listening, you used to be able to make money all across open middle and uh, and and headliner everyone yeah. made money the headliner of course made the most but every you were able to make money now what do they pay what do they pay the openers 25 bucks for the week i mean oh so i was a road dog for for all these years and then all of a sudden there was no road left mm. you know or the people who were t who were who were doing the road were people with no with no um backstory or no credits or because and now of course they're or a viral star and you're like right uh, what <laughs> so 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 the biggest challenge is for me i guess is the fact that i had a, i've had to reinvent myself so many fucking times you know so you just you, the, i've been doing this my whole life Mm -hmm. There is nothing else. There's nothing I'm better. I, there's nothing I'm better. I can't do anything else. You'll hear comics, especially of my generation, go, This is all we know. 
Like, I, I there's not, well, I'm not going to become a fucking cook. I mean, seriously, there's nothing else that I can do in this business except comedy. Yeah. Now, at 50, I went, okay, well, I'm going to have to branch out because I'm not going to be able to just do stand up. So then I started directing. And I directed Jim Florentine's um, uh, one woman's a uh, one man show called I'm Your Savior, which is on Amazon Prime right now. I love uh, it. I've directed a bunch of other people's solo shows. Like I said, I have Caitlin wow. Bailey's show that we're developing. So so that's become something that, you know, and then I've produced other things. And so mm -hmm. in this business, you you know, I when I look one of the things I always try to ask young comics, and maybe you know, there's something it's very important. What do you want out of stand-up comedy? And once you figure that out, you'll be able to go after it. Because I hate to tell you, but going on the road and being a road dog, it, it's it's not really there anymore. No, I don't think so. You know, so you have to figure out what else do you want. The only mm -hmm. thing left for me that I'd like is I want... I've said this for so many years. Maybe somebody will finally do it for me. I just want to be that wacky neighbor in an episode of some sitcom. I just want to open the door and go, and, La -la! and then close the door and walk out. That's all I have left is just what I want to just be that stupid fucking neighbor that walks in. Hey, Bill, you need some milk? And then just leave. That's all I have left. That's the only thing I want to do. That's hilarious. I love that. Uh, so one last question, because we've been going for an hour. I know. Bye. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Dave um, is asking, who's the first famous comedian that you ever met? That's a, oh, wow. Hmm. Let me think about that. Probably Robin Williams, you Ooh. know, um, and, and, and I have some, I have a lovely story about Robin. He, Robin was a very sweet man. Um, uh, just, just very kind. He had a lot of demons, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we had this, wow, I was so young. This is early on in my career. There was a, um, an improv, uh, 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 improv sketch group. Uh, uh, they're going to kill me for not remembering the name. That was the, like the hot thing in New York City. And every so often, they would have a comic come in. And, and Robin used to love to come and play with them. You know, he'd come in and everything. And <laughs> so I forgot what we were doing. I forgot where it was because it's literally, we're talking, it's got to be 40 years ago. Wow. But I remember the story because we were, we were doing, so, so in other words, they would do their improv. They would have a, a comic like, you know, me do like five, 10 minutes. And then they would do, they'd bring in a guest star. And, and Robin at the time was kind of robin williams but not robin williams yet you know yeah yeah and so it, it, it was a, it was it was sort of like tag like it would be the it would be the boy it was the boys versus the girls right and somebody would yell something out and you'd have to do it and whoever got the first laugh you'd move like in other words you'd get a laugh and then you'd go to the back of the line so i get up with robin and I knew I was like, motherfucker, I'm going to be here forever. <laughs> and for some reason, maybe he had to take a breath. I don't know what happened, but I got out a joke first and he had to go to the back of the line. It was so great. It oh, was, my God. And I was like and he looked at me and I was like, I don't believe this. This is so great. It was so funny. But <laughs> he was cool. I mean, I, I ran into him. You know, I didn't know him well, but whenever I ran into him, he could not have been a kinder person. Oh, yeah. Oh. So I think he's that. Yeah, I would say he's probably the, the first famous comic. But I've met a lot. You know what I mean? I've met. You know. Uh, oh, uh, you know. Remember, who you think is famous were people I started with. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. So I mean, like you know, Paul Reiser was the guy that passed me at Catch a Rising Star. So you know, Jerry Seinfeld used to bring me on because he was the MC, and Bill Maher was the MC at Catch a Rising Star. So we knew each other. From way so back, the, from yeah. way back then. I, I mean, I pretty much know everybody. You know everybody, yes. <laughs> pretty much. That's amazing. Uh, well, we've been talking for an hour, and we can keep going. Maybe next time you can come talk about directing and producing. Uh, sure. That would be sure. Really cool. I would love that. I would love to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast for a second time. This was thank so you. awesome and informative. You're an amazing lady and just oh, thank you. 
but 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 and 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 thank you for letting me come and and talk about the special because you know now that now that we're out of covid and and we're everyone is starting to perform again you know we're starting to get back so so mm -hmm. i'm trying to you know we we were we were set back a step mm -hmm. not but but so was so was the entire world was so i i appreciate that you were so kind to let me come out and talk about it again because My you know pleasure. Uh, and for the people who are listening, you know, it's still streaming on Showtime, you know, you, right. And it, and it also plays on Amazon. So if you're too fucking cheap to get Showtime, you can go to Amazon Prime and get it on there. Yeah, and get and, it, yeah. and, and I'm, I really am. I, I'm so proud of the shows because it wasn't just a stand up show. You know, we had the interstitials where we talked to the women about yeah. what it's like to be to be a woman in this business, what it's like to be old in this business. And and and. It's really a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, look into what it's like to be a woman in, in comedy. So, you know, and thank you very much for this. And um, I'm going to go pass out when I get off. <laughs> My pleasure. And if they want to go see the show live, what is the website where they can get the dates for future shows? Yeah, I'm funny. Just go to Funny Women of a Certain Age. Um, uh, and, and, and we also have, we, I think we have the dates on the Facebook page. Um, and if you're in New York city, come see it, uh, come see us at the crane. As soon as, um, LA opens up, I know that LA is, 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 is not opening up again until like June, I think. Yeah. So we're waiting to hear because I want to, you know, we, you know, the, la the where I met you, we yeah. did the show at the improv. The improv so, yeah. so, um, so, uh, you know, I'm hoping to go back there, but you know, until everyone is safe and and everything. But yeah, I mean, thank you so much again. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll have you back. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for all the Bye. questions. Thank you, Dave, Nate, Chris, Howard. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you next weekend.